you have seen history in the second, but there have been some fairly recent changes. It's been the same for a while. And so we're going to talk a bit about what it's been and then what new stuff we're doing to it. As part of the new stuff, I think the laptop is still on this. Is someone streaming it? Yeah, it's on the screen. As part of the new stuff we're doing, um, it's got a new name. Um, right. <laughs> Uh, to worry for sure. I think actually it's the name of a god that uh, does predict past <laughs> drove someone into the sea, so it's quite appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, yes, so um, I'm going to talk a bit about the OPU first. So essentially, the predictor actually is death symbol. It, like, it's quite impressive that it actually works as well as it does. Um, so we download the global forecast system, which is a huge, just giant grid of... Um, oh yeah, I should probably apologize. There's like three slides with maths on. <laughs> but essentially, the, the data set we download looks like this, uh, if you like took one level. It's actually in three dimensions, and it has a lot of little, little arrows which tell us what they think the wind speed might be at that point. And then we would say the balloon is probably going to travel at wind speed, which turns out to be a pretty good approximation. And if we're going to start here, we just join up the arrows. That's it. That's the predictor. <laughs> um, sort of. Uh, the arrows actually change in time, and so you've got you've got a grid of arrows, and you're actually in the middle of that. And then there's another level above you. And then there's another set of arrows in time, so you need to sort of approximate what you reckon it will be now. Sort of like, you know, if you have two points you, and you're in the middle, then you might be able to draw a line and guess. Well, now you need to do that in four dimensions. That's fine. Um, the, the wind data set doesn't actually tell you what they think the outer, like the, an arrow for each altitude. They give you an arrow for each pressure and then tell you what they think the altitude of that pressure level will be which you know, makes it a bit more fiddly. Um, oh yes, and the other thing is, um, we assume that a balloon is going to go up at a constant rate, which turns out to be pretty good. A while back there were some graphs kicking around on uh, IRC. I don't have any for you, but like, in reality it is pretty close to constant rate ascent. And we have a simple model that uh, assumes you fall at terminal velocity, which you do. And then there's this like, model of uh, what the density of the air would be say it's probably going to be about that. And the final complication is that um, we get a lot of predictions, and so we only have one server. It's, it's pretty good, but we need to be able to do pr predictions really quickly to keep up and to not annoy people. So the predictor has been running as a project in Cambridge University Space Flight for some time. Um, I quite like this title slide actually, it's the very first web interface it ever had, which was around 2008-2009. And um, not much has changed, Churchill College, Cambridge is still the default launch site. But, um, still on? The uh, interface has gotten a little easier to use since, and we no longer have this solid black background, which I think is probably an improvement. You know, back in 2008, we were happy, but it now worked worldwide and up to 120 hours in the future, <laughs> which is still the case today. So let's have a look. We've got a kind of brief timeline that we've tried to put together by going back years and several layers deep in old SVN repositories labeled Here Be Dragons and Don't Go Any Further and Really I Warned You. Um, <laughs> As far as we can tell, the first version really was written by Rob Anderson way back when, and this was a piece of C++ which you could run on your desktop, and it was very fiddly. You had to download the Win data sets for the area you wanted yourself, and then you had to run a separate program to turn them into CSV files, and then this thing output a different CSV, and then you could convert that to a KML and view it in Google Earth. And it worked, but it's a little difficult. Eventually, Rob and Fergus wrote the first, and possibly other people whose names are lost to history, wrote the first version of the web interface, which made it much easier to use, and from then on it's been a kind of steadfast tool of the HAP community, at least in the UK and slowly internationally. So I'm sure you'll know how useful it is, right? It's very helpful to be able to guess where your balloon will go. 
Um, sometime later, Rich Waring came along and made everything look a lot better and then left and hasn't touched it since, so that was nice. John Solon and I redid the user interface and some of the back end stuff and tacked around with some Python to make everything a little bit faster and nicer. Eventually, this year, we decided, oh, here we go, we'll get rid of a list of people. You can see how it's kind of evolved. This year, we decided it would be fun to take it on as a project for some of the new members in the society, so there are a few new names appearing at the bottom of the list. Um, yeah, okay, so that's broadly how it's got to where it is today. We've been slowly working on this, making improvements, responding to feature requests. Um, these days, the biggest feature request is to predict floats, right? Back in 2008, we were happy to manage up and down in three hours. <laughs> Pretty sure that piece of code would have long since given up the ghost of a 30 day prediction. So, um, those are the kind of things we're working on. And so, yeah, we decided to redo the whole code eventually because what we have at the moment is this horrible mess of three different programming languages, including PHP, which kind of shells out using at to run a command. It's awful. Um, so, we had a small competition to rewrite the whole predictor in a few different programming languages just to see what would be quick and work well. And we ended up rewriting it in Python, we did it in Python again a different way, we did it in C++, we did it in Go, we did it in Haskell, and compared all of them. And, um, do I have some stats? Right, yeah, in the end we decided to choose Python. The Go version was nice, but has this awful bug <laughs> where it can only manage a 4 gigabyte data set. And so can only predict a very small section of the world and you can't work around it. It's a fundamental flaw in the language as stands, which is awful. The Haskell version was beautiful and very functional and pure and ran dog slow. It was like <laughs> half a second for prediction compared to our benchmark, which was about two milliseconds for the C version. <laughs> yeah. So um, the first Python version was also very slow. It wasn't so great. The C++ was about less difficult for C. But eventually we came across Siphon, which is a tool for Python that lets you write something that looks a lot like Python and actually gets compiled to C before you run it. And um, in 150 lines of code, we got a working predictor that does everything, mostly the C version does, and takes about two milliseconds per prediction, which was dead on what we were hoping for. Advantage is this time it's all in Python, it's a really short piece of code. Anyone can have a look at it, figure out how it works fairly easily. And crucially, we can add these new features like float support and actual APIs. People don't have to bodge into the current kind of API thing that was never meant to be public, and so forth. Um, oh yeah, and I guess as part of the history as well, some, we've got some usage stats. Actually, we were inspired at the conference last year to start collecting this data. Yeah. So this is how many predictions we've run per day over the last year. And uh, like this line, it's 1,750 per day. We work out to about 2,000 on average for the last year. And we also plot where people run predictions from. So this chart shows every location someone's run a prediction from in the last year, which is 730,000 predictions. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm not really sure what that line on the front of the is. I think someone may have typed a zero one too many times in the input box. Or someone's running a script. I mean, I'm disappointed no one's drawn shapes on the map, frankly. <laughs> What you can see is pretty much everywhere there are people, there are predictions. And in fact, lots of places there aren't people, like Antarctica is dotted with them, as is the middle of the ocean. But um, yeah, we've got a lot of predictions over the last year, and we're looking set to serve even more as we go. OK, so back to Daniel to talk about the speed. Until they reached the end of the data set, something like didn't catch up. 
at any rate, we like occasionally you had to log into the server and just clear them out. Um, so we started adding hacks, like the the alarm is a C function. That, like if you don't set up what you want to handle the alarm, it just kills your presence. So that's great. Um, we used to be using uh, this thing called Open End App for to get Win data, um, which had a variety of fun problems. Like pretty much the next three items are problems with this. Uh, the first one is that. Uh, so we needed to find out what the latest data set is, so we go and ask the, the Win server, what do you have? Okay, I'll use the latest one. The problem is, like, a common, these servers were used a lot, so the common tactic used by the NOAA, who provide the data, was they get several of them, give them different IP addresses, and have the name resolved to all of them, and then you would end up picking one at random every time you connected. And then, so the problem is, you'd, you'd say, okay, which data sets do you have? I want that one. And then you'd send another request, you'd get a different server. And if it happened to be around the time that they were releasing a new data set, that wouldn't have one, and then it would crash. Uh, so if you remember that error message, that's what that was. Uh, like around the time that we started getting problems and started to slow down, that, that kept happening all the time for like a, a good period around when the new data set was being released. Because it takes about an hour for them to push these files to their server. Because although we only use a little bit of it, these things are huge. Um, once we had the data from Win servers, uh, the downloader was written in Python. Uh, we then write it out to CSV, which is read, was read by the old predictor, which is written <coughs> in C. Reading from CSV is a bit slow, so you don't want to do that all the time. So we had, it had sort of like a cache in there. And so there was an interesting bug where if, the, if you remember the red rectangle, that was the area of Win that was going to download. And if it went outside, so it downloaded that and wrote it to a temporary directory for the predictor to actually use. And then if it went outside of that, there might be another file in the temporary directory. It'll just use that. But that could have been from last week. <laughs> and uh, finally, reading from CSV is slow. Uh, so, of course, you want to cache it. Uh, there was a fairly complex caching structure written in C, uh, so it's exported all the time. Finally, oh yes, and finally, like whatever happened, I don't know whether more people started using them, whether it was us, but the these servers just got too slow. They they wouldn't respond. It would say, send it was spent ten minutes asking for Win data. Eventually, like the when they said they had several servers, like that number started going down. They all got pretty bad. Um, yeah. So we needed to fix that. <laughs> and that's why we decided to download the whole thing in one go. <laughs> so essentially what we do now is we download uh, the entirety of the relevant portion of the GFS HD dataset that's useful to us. It comes compressed, it's about 6 gigabytes, four times a day. Uh, we throw away most of it, keep about 1.8 gigabytes and then decompress that into a massive like array. Of course, it's, it used to be 18 gigabytes. We've switched from doubles to floats because the, the precision isn't that high anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, so that's a nine gigabyte. We can't keep that in memory. The server only has four gigabytes. So we write that to disk. And if you haven't met it, uh, there's a magic function called memory map, which says to Linux, like, I want you to take this file and take this region of memory and pretend that that file's there. And it will do it. And this is not an entirely unreasonable thing to do, because this is actually what Linux does when you run a program. It says, this is my program. It says, right, I'll put it in memory there. And then you can start executing it. It doesn't copy it, necessarily. It just says, this mem re region of memory corresponds to this region of disk. And this means that we can take our 9 gigabit data set and just treat it as if we had loaded it into memory. And then behind the scenes, when I want this bit, Linux says, ah, I don't have that yet. I'll go and load it. And then if you want it again, it's now in memory. And this isn't a silver bullet, but the caching is pretty good. Which means that the predictions run in like two milliseconds or something crazy. Um, and yes, they, this is the sort of caching CSV reading infrastructure I mentioned, which is like one, that's 1,000 lines is half the size of the predictor C binary that we used to have. And essentially, I've omitted the error checking, but we replaced it with three lines. <laughs> um, 
So, long story short, um, when I said we join up the arrows, the naive way of doing that is to say, I'm here, I want to go one second into the future, the arrow says the wind is this speed, I'll multiply the speed it says it is by the time I want to go, right, I'm now here, and you repeat until you've ended up, until you've landed. Uh, that's called the forward Euler method, and we had uh, the, the time step was set to one second, I don't know how they chose that, but it, that was fine. Uh, the problem is, like, when your flight's taking three hours, it's a bit slow. The, like, errors can accumulate, because when you say, I want to go here, like, that's not perfect, because the wind speed will change between here and there, so it's not, like, perfectly accurate. Um, RK4 is like a magic algorithm that does so much ridiculously better that we can set the time step to 60 seconds, get better accuracy, and it'll run so much faster. Um, so much faster that the like the tightest inner loop, the bit that does the actual prediction, written in C using this method, is the same speed as this method written in Python, but uh, using Python to speed it up. And, and like if you actually want to hear more about RK4, then come and find us afterwards. So I'm like not going to dig into What's it. The now. Oh yes, sorry. So right, when the when the time step is set to sixty seconds, um, and we'll get a lot, get on to landing in a second. But like you can imagine, say you're when you're descending at five meters a second, and your time step is sixty seconds, you're going to drop quite a lot in one go. So you're quite liable to clip the whole way through the ground, and that will produce a big error. So when we detect we've landed, we say right, we've landed somewhere between these two points, and then we check the middle has it landed and we start like, dividing it up until we found the actual landing point. And that it has also improved the accuracy a lot. Great. Um, so, the exciting new features, this is pretty much the wrapping up part of the talk. Um, previously, we had problems where we assume the ground is flat and at sea level for landing purposes which works most of the time, but obviously right, it has some issues. It's great if you're landing in the sea, it works perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, some of you don't enjoy that. This is the kind of problem we'd have before. You come along and here's the ground, and we say you land over here because actually into the surface of the earth, that's where sea level is. It's more serious if you're landing on a mountain, it's like here's the ground, and we say you're landing way over here, which is a hell of a hike. You don't want that. So we also downloaded a whole load of elevation data, used some of the same kinds of software that we use in the predictor to work out the actual surface height of the Earth at every point on the Earth. And we check that all the time during descent to work out when you're going to hit it as part of our binary search stuff. So now you land where you should do, on the side of a mountain. So this is nice. I mean, hopefully not many people are landing on mountains anyway, but in the event, you should find it works a lot better now. Right, <laughs> floats, we can predict floats now, great. Right. Um, it's actually not so hard to add, it turns out, but no, there we go. And there's a new user interface, just as you've gotten used to the old one. Um, it will probably change a bit before it's quite public, but <laughs> it looks a bit more like I don't know, Web 2.0. We're using Bootstrap now, it's very exciting. Um, so, I don't know, is there anything good to say about the new user interface? <laughs> the uh, panel on the left slides back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It's very cool. It can also do hourlies in this fancy new way where you get this pretty visualization and you can sweep through time and it shows you the path and also the hourlies are just a thing you run as the normal predictor. There's a box here where you say whether you want one prediction or 500 predictions and it takes the same amount of time and then you get your hourly predictions which is quite nice. So you don't have to have anyone set it up anymore um, and it doesn't run on a schedule, you just run it whenever you want which is nice. Right, there's a real API which will probably get maybe one person in the room besides me excited, but <laughs> essentially previously there was this awful thing where you could pretend that you were the website and try and make a prediction request and it kind of worked and it was a bit dubious and now we have this actual proper API where you tell it what you want and you can say I'm a floater or you can say oh, I want this special fancy model that we don't even support yet or whatever you like and you tell it where you're launching from and it gives you back this nicely passed data set which is easy to do what you want with. The idea here being it becomes much easier to then build the predictor into all sorts of other software. For instance, Face Near Us, which currently has this awful bodge for doing predictions, can now really easily do a prediction for every balloon based on its current position and the send rate and data and so on and so forth. 
and possibly other things, right? The Habitat API has seen all sorts of uses from people doing things we never thought of, and hopefully the same will be the case with Predictor. It's really fast. Like, you could do Monte Carlo methods in the browser and JavaScript, and the data would come back quick enough, it would be great. So hopefully people will do that. It's so fast that you don't have to pass around like polling or anything. You don't have to say start a prediction and come back later. It just gives it to you. Like the, the prediction is by far the, well, the web request is by far the slowest part of the process. Um, or you passing the results probably. Uh, it's open source as before, but because it's like six gig a day for twenty four gig a day of download every single day. Um, disk space to go with, you probably don't want to run it yourself, but you know you can, and it is just a Python package which you can pip install, so that's, that's nice. And it's on GitHub, as you might expect. Cool. Um, that, that was a photo of Cambridge University Space Flight Summer Projects, and that pretty much wraps up the predictor talk, I think. Yes? Is that Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that it's at Francing. <laughs> Um, great, so I think if we've got time, we're planning to field some questions if anyone has any, basically. But yeah. If they're quick, perhaps some feature requests. Oh, yeah, and if you have feature requests from New Predictor, now would be a great time to get them in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, that wraps up the talk. I'll take questions. When is it going to get rolled out? Real soon now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only some of those papers. <laughs> the, most, like, the hourly predictor stuff you see all works, and the API the user interface is there. The chunk's missing. Um, yeah, but have you or will you collect data on the accuracy, um, given that you've got a fairly big step size, but as a function of how messy the wind data is, so for example, if you're going to be very tired of changing the areas, versus it, or have, and therefore have you considered <coughs> the adaptive step sizes as a, as a function of the dynamics of the wind? Kind of two answers to this, but I'll pass over to Daniel for the adaptive step sizes. Um, so the long, the, the short answer to your question is that no, we haven't thought about it yet, but I may or may not be collecting wind data archived chunks for the UK so that when we do want to do it, we can compare actual flights to things. Um, as for like whether or not we're going, like the details, that would probably be quite a long answer. Well, good. Something I noticed, mainly um, on the space near that says, um, during descent, the prediction tends to fluctuate quite wildly. I'm not sure if that was a problem that's now been fixed or if it's almost going to continue. And I was wondering, he seemed to be working out the drag coefficient of the payload using the um, payload's descent rate, and it all seemed to be going a little bit wrong because like, there's lots of noise or the drag coefficient is fluctuating with altitude. It looks like something that could be improved a lot for um, sort of light landing spots in the future. I would not be surprised if it just uses the last point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the project it just uses the last point, but it just takes the current descent speed and extrapolates that to sea level, yeah. which is all great. Yeah. So, doing that. At least, at least some kind of low So, probably, I'm not sure you could you, you count the filtering or something. Um, the SM rate being a straight line basically, but that's not always the case, is it? But hydrogen tends to accelerate a bit. So I took all the data we have in Habitat for SM rates and looked at this, and it's like very much close to a straight line almost all of the time. Yeah. The helium stuff is more of a straight line, yeah. maybe the hydrogen not so much towards the end. Yeah. But so for the time being, it's very much a good enough model. It is like pretty much dead on a straight line. The air is really small, even for hydrogen balloons, we found. The new predictor actually makes it really easy to change the assembly. So the idea is as part of the API and therefore exposing the user interface, you can choose different dramatic descent models and it becomes
becomes very easy for us to swap in more accurate okay. books later, which is nice. It's just there's a place in the publisher and you say, I have this amplitude, what's my set rate? Okay, that's cool. Because the, the other example would be an underfilled balloon which starts off at you know, two meters a second. Right, sure. and everyone says it's too slow, it's too slow, and then it speeds up. I think that's the CD of the balloon changing as well. Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. But, but, um, but that's another example of, of the speed changing. Yeah, it's a good uh, coordinate technology with extra RAM in the new servers that are going in. And the mechanics, yeah, we'll just magically cache all data set, even right. faster, it'd be great. <laughs> uh, we won't even need to touch anything, it'll just work, it's amazing. To uh, what I said on memory mapping, where like, it, it's pretty good. <coughs> if you can't, it's not a substitute for writing like a dedicated, like, purpose-built cache, but it, it's fast enough, and it works in this case, you can break it. For example, um, if, you take, if you ask it to map a huge, huge chunk of memory, and then write one byte to every page across the whole thing, uh, it will send you sick bus and your process will die. And um, when I was debugging this and I didn't know uh, what was going on, I decided to ignore sick bus and see what would happen. And that box died and I had to log into the virtual machine host and kill it. So it's not, you, you can't get it to do magic anything. But uh, in these cases, it's pretty good because in general, there are large sections of the data set you probably won't use. And there are sections that are going to get hit a lot, and those will just stay in memory. And the more memory, the more RAM we have in the server, the more bits that get to stay in memory. So 